Welcome back. Let's take a look at our exceptions lab. I know by now you're very curious about how these exceptions really happen. A help on exceptions produces a lot of information, but in there somewhere is the hierarchy of exceptions, which are classes. So here we have the hierarchy. Take a look here at the arithmetic error which inherits from standard error, which inherits from exception. From arithmetic error, three inherit, three errors. What that means to us is that if we collect an arithmetic error, we're actually going to collect all of these errors, arithmetic error and the three subclasses. So that's interesting. Also, if you do a help on exceptions, now notice these helps are with the string exceptions. Using the string of a library, the syntax where we do a help on a string is error prone. When you do that, be sure you're not getting the help for a string, that it really finds what you typed there. When we do a help on them, we see that every exception has all this in it because it is inherited from the big base class exception. It has these three pieces of magic. And we know what they mean. We'll see them pop up in the lecture. We see the method resolution order, which we saw from the diagram. When you collect an exception, here I'm collecting a value error as info and then printing that info. What comes into info is an object of the value error type. So it's an object. When we print it, it pushes it through its magic string. So that's what that is used for. If I do this, it'll crash because this is the object. It is not a string, so I cannot concatenate it. However, I could put it in a formatted string, and it knows how to call its magic string, or the str. All these things call a magic string, so magic string is very useful. If you want to collect several exceptions when you're doing something, you can collect them just like this, line them up, and then you'll have different processing for each of these two. If you want them to both be collected but be processed the same, then you put your exceptions in a tuple. When we started, we didn't collect the exception object. It looked like that. No problem. You can always add an else, and I'll remind you that it is a good idea. You want to try to put as little as possible in your try clause, and only what can raise the exceptions that you name. You don't want to put this something else in the try in block. It makes for easier debugging. A lot easier. You can add a finally clause. That clause will absolutely happen, whether an error is raised or not. There's another form of finally, if you like it better. I have my finally here that will happen. And when it is nested in a try except, then this finally will re-raise that error to be caught out here in the outer level. I don't usually recommend that you catch a generic exception. You want to have more control of your code than that. However, when you're all finished, it's a great idea to put your whole application in a try except so that anything that happens that was not expected, you'll get that information. So here's a little function, and it's just going to raise an error. You'll see that I am importing sys and trace back. That's because sys has within it some very handy attributes. sys.exceptInfo is a function, and it uh, passes back two values. The first one is the exception type, and also comes the exception value. The type being the class, and the value is the exception object. The traceback module gives you various calls. One you might like a lot is format exception. It gives you the string version of the exception. There it is. 
so you can mail it to yourself and then go on with your application so that nobody knows that there was a problem except you when you get your email. Once you understand classes, it's very easy to learn how exceptions are handled in Python. Give the exercise a try. I'll see you when you're ready to look at the solution.